Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered, the show that lifts the curtain behind the adult industry and gets to know the wonderful people in it. Um, I'm going to introduce my guest today in a moment. But first, of course, I always want to give a shout out to my sponsors at Blue Chew, a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. If you want to spice your sex life back up again or you have those first date jitters, Give Blue Chew a try. You can try it for free with my code Holly. Just pay $5 shipping. BlueChew.com, code Holly to try Blue Chew for free. Just pay for the shipping. All right. So my guest today I'm very excited about. It's taken me a while to wrangle her over here to my Woodland Hills studio. But um, my guest today has been in the fold of Penthouse Magazine for almost three decades. She started first as a June 1993 pet, then a columnist, then a penthouse pet manager, a production manager, and now the photo editor. She has slept with more than 500 men and isn't afraid to talk about it. Welcome, Sam Phillips. That is the best intro anyone's ever given me. You summarized me to a T. Wow. And you've done a fuck ton of interviews and a fuck ton of shows. Mm -hmm. And hear that, guys? I am the best. She is the best. Everyone, (laughs) Holly Randall is the best. (laughs) So, Sam, I mean, you have such a long career. Uh, I I guess we should start at the beginning. Is that where you want to start? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's fine. I've been... Modeling for 41 years. Wow. I'm 58. Yay! Um, I just turned 58. Uh, How did it feel to turn 58? I, okay, so I've always lied about my age, but I've lied up about my age. Interesting. Um, When I was young, I was on my own super early. My mom threw me out on the streets. I was an underage teenager. So to not be preyed upon by various people and to just be able to get by without being, I don't know, bad shit happening or Mm -hmm. the least amount of bad shit happening. It was just better if I was older. It wasn't cool if I said, oh yeah, I'm 13 years old and I live on the streets. I'm 14 years old and I live on the streets. So I was like 18. So I'd always lied about my age and I found that, so I'm 58, but I like to say now that I'm 60 because look at me. Do I look 60? No. So if I said I'm 45, people would go, ah, yeah, you know, you look good. No. But if I say I look 60, they think I look fucking incredible. <laughs> I love this reverse psychology. This is great. Oh, yeah. No, I'm all about the psychology. So I've always lied. I was 25. I said I was 30. I was 30. I said I was 35. And then so this birthday, I kind of forgot how old I was. I'm like, how fucking old am I? I was born in 66. Do the math. I just turned 58. Wow. Yeah. I remember when I was younger, like old, like old people or older people forgetting how old they were. And I remember thinking that that was insane. Yeah. I was like, how could you possibly forget how old you are? But you know, when you're young, yeah. especially like up to 18 or 21 or mm-hmm. maybe 30, like you are like each year matters because it's like another oh, milestone yeah. in your life or oh, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm definitely at that eight, that time. Too, I'm like, how old am I? How old are you? Oh, fuck, fine. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm. <laughs> this is I don't stop. know. It's stop. Uh, I'm 45. <laughs> okay. Um, was 45 a big birthday for you? No. Yeah. See, I think it's like 30, 40, 50, yeah. 60. Yeah. Like the big ones, 18. Yeah. 18, 21. Yes. Maybe 25. Yes. I but mean, definitely 30 because by 30 you should have your shit together. Yeah. By 40, now you feel like you're old, but I never felt old. I also think that age is a number, clearly, but it's a state of mind. Mm -hmm. And if you feel young and you think young and you look young, then you're young. So I don't feel like I'm 60. That's why I love to say that I'm 60. So I have a question for you because I'm I'm curious to how it relates to my experience. So Obviously, you know, you've worked with Penthouse for so many years yeah. and now you're the photo editor. We worked together. Yes, we with did. Corey Yi. Who I saw on your show. Who you came guys on the show. did phenomenal. I didn't call her Connie once. <laughs> oh my God, that's right. <laughs> I accidentally <laughs> called her like Connie, like for the first half of the shoot. She didn't say anything. And then like someone brought it up. Maybe it was you. And then it was like mortified. <laughs> but we made it a joke, so it was yeah. fine. 
But anyways, but um, she called you a different name too. She started calling me Heidi. Yes. Yeah. So like we made a joke about it because yeah. I was like, <sighs> yeah. Um. But so you're obviously around young, beautiful women all mm-hmm. the time, and I experience the same thing. You know, yeah. shooting and interviewing yeah. um, younger girls in the industry. How does that make you feel about your age? Does it make you feel weird about your age? Because I I find that I for me it's like two things. There are some times when it makes me feel super old and I'm like, right. oh my God, I can't believe I'm this old because I was right. 20 when I started in the industry. And then there are other times that like, I feel like we're the same age and I forget yes. that I'm older than them. And then there'll be this moment where they say something like, I don't know, they never like heard Like they of- don't know Duran Duran. I was just going to say Depeche Mode. So, so I yeah. I have this in my house all the time. Yeah. So something like that. And then I'm like, fuck, I am, we are not the same age. Or I'll be like, how old your mom? And then she's like, my age or younger. And I'm like, what? But so, so okay. like, how does it work for you? Okay, so I, okay, so aside from working at Penthouse, I fell into running a model house mm-hmm. in my personal home. And uh, you going- You poor I, no, I, no, it's crazy. Like the whole fucking thing is, is nuts and I'll tell you about it. But so I'll go out with these kids. Like we went to- What's that MB3, the thing where you putt putt and you you throw axes and I don't know, it's like this what the kids do these days. I have, I have no idea. Oh no, it's crazy. Do. You can drink, they they let you drink and then throw axes. They let you drink and and like do bumper cars and dude, I don't like racing around like speedways and yeah, it's somewhere in Santa Clarita. Anyway, so I go and do these kid things with the kids. And I, when I say kids, they're not children, they are 18 through 25. Yeah. So anybody under 40, you're a fucking kid. I'm sorry. And as far as I'm concerned, I was like, hey, kid. And then, you know, if I'm irritated with you because I'll call grown men, kid, look, look, kid. So like, that's my way of like, mm. so anyway, I'll go out with these kids and we'll be buying, I don't know, something. And they'll say to the cute little kid, hey, your mom, does your mom want something? And I'm like, that's right on their fucking mother. So there's a donut shop where by the place that I'm currently half living in right now and about to move. And I go in there on the weekends with a different porn star. And the little Asian man who owns it said to me last weekend, oh, you have many kids. And I'm like, (laughs) I sure do. I have a lot. So I've gone in there with like five different girls that are blonde, brunette, redhead, like every different look, but they're all my children. Yes, they are. So I have completely and fully embraced the fact that I am a mother-like figure to others. and, And I actually really fall into it like like hardcore to where I am feeling older, like you're as young as you feel, but at times I feel older because I'm responsible for so many things in a house. And then I'm responsible corporately for my job duties. And there's a lot of responsibility. So then it does feel heavy, Mm -hmm. like sometimes heavy, Yeah, but I enjoy it because I've earned every fucking mile milestone in year that mm-hmm. I have lived through. I'm proud of it. I love it. I I am open about it. I uh, and one of my favorite things with the kids that live in my house is I love like dispensing wisdom um, every time there's like a newbie that comes. So there's several different modeling agents that know it all started here. It all started when I had moved. Okay, it all started with Kenna James, uh, to be honest. So I had an apartment in Hollywood, a two bedroom apartment. In 2016, Kelly Holland, the then owner of Penthouse, I was writing for the magazine at the time, and she called me into the office and asked me if I would chaperone Kenna James to Sturgis, which was hilarious. It was like two of us having so much fucking fun, and there was no chaperone. We were just wild. The Sturgis the is like the motorcycle yes. like convention or yes. race or something. Yes. So we bonded immediately, like my immediate daughter that I never knew that I needed or had or wanted. And so she was living not in Los Angeles. And every time that she would come in, she would stay in my apartment. So her and Emily Addison, another penthouse pet, Mm -hmm. would also stay in my apartment. So I was like, Jesus, like, then I had one cat and then I fostered three. So then there was four jumping around the place. And I'm like, I need a bigger apartment for my cats and the two, you know, penthouse pets that stay with me. So then I was like, what if I just get a house and I'll have one roommate. And then I'll have open bedrooms for Kenna and Emily. 
That's how it started. And then everyone found out that I had a house with extra bedrooms and it's a beautiful house. My, my old house, gorgeous. So all of a sudden I was full, I was full up and I started at $50 a night and all you can eat. My kitchen was open, my pantry, my refrigerator, anything, coffee, water, laundry, internet, content, shoot anywhere you want. Just let me know because there's a gardener and a pool man and we don't want to do it when they're yeah, around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But like, and that's how it started. And it got to the point where that house was too small and people were doubling up in rooms, best friends and Kenna would sleep in my room. Like, you know, it was just like squeezing everybody in, but it turned out to be a big family and nobody comes to my house. That's just off the streets. You have to be referred by a friend, a model. Yeah. I know your agent that vouches for you because if yeah. anything goes on, you don't pay, you know, they'll cover it kind of thing. So one of the agents that I, I take girls in is matrix models and Zen models. Mm -hmm. And they specialize in the new girls, mm -hmm. like fresh off the bus. Yeah. So, you know, there's different model houses in LA. They're all great. They all offer different you know, virtuous things about them. But I think what we offer is it's a family. There's always at least two to three pros staying there, meaning people that have been in the industry a long time, like a Kenna. Mm -hmm. um, and like Viviani De Silva is there right now. Um, Yelena Marie is there right now. I have a bunch of uh, Aria Sloan is there right now. So when a new girl comes in, we will sit them down. We'll ask them, you know, they half the time they don't have a name yet. So we help them come up with a name, make sure they do their social media, give them the do's and the don'ts and the ins and the outs of the industry. Hold it's your like ground. A cr crash course in porn. Uh, every fucking time. It's like once a week and we all sit around the table and we all do it all over again. But I take the, it makes me cry. I take the responsibility very seriously. Some of these kids are coming from their parents' homes. Some of these kids don't even have parents or a home. And they're like in my home and they're like my responsibility. They're my charge now. So I need to make sure they're okay. They have everything they need, that they're safe. Um, you have my phone number. When you go work, you share your location. Like I, I want like my house to be a safe haven for people that are coming new into the industry. And yeah. I, you know, it's a big responsibility. I know all their parents. I speak to them. They give me their parents' numbers because in case of an emergency, please give your parents my number. Their parents feel better. Yeah. You know, significant others. I have girls that are married that come, girls with their boyfriends that come. I have guys that stay, guys that stay with their girlfriends. I'm open to everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have, I mean... I'm going to ask this in this way, but I know that you have because this has happened to everybody. So you take a great responsibility in trying to guide girls in the right direction, um, give them the right advice, give them a safe place to say, what happens when they won't do that? Like, because we all have, you know, we like all have stories just, of girls that just don't listen. They right. go like, or they go, you like, you know, it's like, you can try to do everything that you can to steer somebody right in the adult industry, but it's not for everybody. And some people like just shouldn't be there in the first place. Agreed. And then they go. Agreed. And they they do these these things. These make I these have to tell decisions. people all the time because adult stars get a bad rap. Yeah. People, civilians think, you know, they're on drugs. Uh, they were sexually molested. Uh, they, you know, they're trafficked and forced into this world. 90%, 99, 95, whatever. I don't want to say too high. Of every porn star I know, loves what they do, um, chose to do what they do, are good at what they do, um, are hypersexual, exhibitionists, love the acting, love the performance aspect of it, love turning people on, love making people happy. Like it gives me chills. There's a certain person that's cut out for this industry. Mm -hmm. And like you said, a lot of the young kids are trying to just get away from home. So that's always my first question. So like, why are you in, why are you want to be in this industry? A lot of them are found on websites like sexyjobs.com. So they're already doing sexy things and nudity online. So porn is the next step. Mm -hmm. It's a big step. Like it's a very exposing step. It's out there forever. It's, you know, you do one porn and then you decide not to do it again. Your porn is going to be out there if you decide to do a corporate job 10 years from now and you're 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So you really have to 
And I assume you tell the girls all of this. Everything, like yeah. everything. I literally just talked to a woman who was a grown woman with three kids um, out of doing porn like a couple of days ago. See, okay, so I, I can't, I can't like, talk anybody in my house that was placed in my house right. out of doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because agents trust me to take care of their models. Right. But you, in discussing like what motivated them to do it, well, yeah, you when find I, out like right. what well, their story is. When I say when I talked her out of porn, I just like was very honest with her. Right. And I think she realized that it right. wasn't, you know what I mean? Because she was right. like, oh, well, I hope my kids don't see it. And I was like, they're going to see it. Yeah. Like, and Even this was you change your name. Yeah, no and to be what. honest, this was like she was on OnlyFans and was considering doing pro porn. I'm like, your kids will see it. Right. Like, you but, need to I mean, understand. There's a that. chance her kids will see the OnlyFans. That's I told her that too. I said, there's a good chance that they'll see this, but you do have more control over it. It's your own content that you're creating. Yes. And like, you do what you want. Um, if you shoot for another brand, it's not under your control. You don't own the content. And if you change your mind, they're not down the road, down. they can't take. Even if they, if they, if they do take it it'll down, be on Pornhub, it'll be yeah. on. X it'll videos. be like it'll, it'll be, be wherever. Right. Yeah, it'll be on. It'll, it'll be on people's hard drives, dude. Yeah, that's the thing, because I've had girls come to me, and I and I always take it down if they ask me to. Right. But I'm like, I can't control what's out on the internet on deep dive Reddit threats. Like right. I can't. Like you, it's an irreversible decision. Yes, and I try to make sure that people understand that. Yeah, do you think that there should be like uh, an age limit? A, a beginning age. I know people talk about this all the this time. Is, like you shouldn't be able to get into the industry unless you're 21. Yeah. Or like this is a great to be 21 to drive or 21 to you know mm -hmm. whatever. Should you be 21 to? So this is porn? a great question. And actually, I was going to kind of ask you the same oh, thing okay. um, because I am really like on the fence about it because I see both sides. Yes, but I I meet really adult 18 yeah years. excuse me i was living on my own when i was 14 fucking years yeah. old and i had apartments all over the fucking world yeah you would never have been able to tell me when i was younger i was i was an old soul i was an absolute adult i i had a path and i had a journey and i was on it yeah so and i do also know that like some people and you kind of just touched on this briefly um girls have used porn to get out of a bad situation and gain financial independence and get away from a bad home, a bad boyfriend, a bad, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. like it's actually been the, you know, landing board that has enabled them to move on to a better place in yes. their life. Yes. And I also like, it's just kind of like, it's one of those tricky things. It's like, if we have decided that like you're an adult at 18 and like we've decided you're an adult at 18, like, you know, you can't start then creating- these, these adults these can't go out and-, and Borders. Get, they can't get go out and get a, um, a vape. They can't go out and yeah. have a drink. So yeah. you're 18, you can fuck on camera, but you can- You can also sign up for the army and you can go to war and yeah. you can blow up other people and you can die. Yeah. You can vote. Yeah. You can like pay tax. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like, it's it's a hard thing to argue, so I kind of stay neutral on it right. because I'm just like it's individual. It's individual. It, it really is. And I think like if the age became 21, obviously I would fully accept that and be like, all right, like yeah. But who fine. who's the regulator? Who who makes the law? There's there's no lawmaker in porn like that. Yeah. Well, it would have to be a law instituted like, by like the U.S. government, which yeah. But and that's a oh, and that is slope. oh no no yeah. They are not exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a complicated question. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Right. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about your beginnings oh. because you, you know, have already alluded to a, uh, yeah, a, a tough childhood. Yeah. And, but it's made in, you into who you are today. I love me and I would not do any of it different ever again. Yeah. So I can't wait to hear your story. So stick around, guys. We'll be right back. This episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Blue Chew. If you haven't heard of it, Blue Chew is a game changer for so many guys out there, especially those who want to keep things exciting in the bedroom. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form. This means no more awkward doctor's visits or waiting in line at the pharmacy. This means no more awkward doctor's visits or waiting in line at the pharmacy. Everything is done online discreetly and is shipped directly to your door in a nondescript package. Because let's face it, privacy matters. Now, why am I talking to you about Blue Chew? Because confidence is sexy and being ready when the moment feels right is something that all of us appreciate. Blue Chew can help men gain that extra confidence that they might need, ensuring that when things get heated, they're ready to impress. 
Now, if you're interested in trying Blue Chew, they've got a special deal for my listeners. Try Blue Chew for free, yes, free, with my promo code Holly. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code Holly to receive your first month for free. Remember, it's all about having fun and enjoying those intimate moments without worry. So visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And thank you, Blue Chew, for sponsoring the podcast. All right, everybody, we are back. So Sam, your career started after you got kicked out of your house as a teen. Um, so what happened and where did you go from there? Oh God, okay, let me see, summarizing it very quickly. Um, my mother, bless her soul, she's uh, dead. Uh, she uh, never really wanted kids. Uh, she had an affair in the army with my, with my dad. Uh, they got pregnant. They ended up leaving the army. They were honorably discharged because you cannot be in the army pregnant, right? Um, my mother didn't really know my father. They realized they didn't really get along or like each other. And then uh, he left. It turns out um, ugh, she was abusive, like physically abusive, like very badly, like bones broken, many bones broken. My wrists like eight times, my ankle, my ribs. Uh, just, Jesus. she was, she responded with her fists to, as a child. Um, it's tough. So everybody knew it, you know, the schools knew it, everybody knew it. Nobody did anything about it. Wah, 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 wah. My dad tried to win me through the courts back in the day. And this is cause I'm older. There was a movie called Kramer versus Kramer. Do you remember that movie? And the dad was trying to win the boy and he couldn't because the courts would always give the kid to the mom, mm -hmm. regardless of the situation. So he didn't get me. I stayed with my mother. Um, she continued to abuse me um, and then threw me out when I was 13. So uh, I actually, I ran away when I was 13 and then I came back home and then she threw me out when I was 14. Wow. And where did I go? She made sure that I couldn't go to any friend's houses. So she called my friend's parents and said, I don't know, I did something horrible and don't let me in their house. Just, you know, hoping that I would eventually have to come back or I, I don't really know what she was thinking. But mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Brooklyn. I was born in the army uh, in Maryland and uh, was very independent as a kid. Uh, took the train into Manhattan all the time for various different things when I was younger. So I just got on the train and went to Manhattan and I went to this place called the village where I knew there were gay people. And if I go to the gay area, then chances of me getting raped or molested would probably be slimmer. Wow. So I then went and I slept on a set of stairs and then I met other runaways and we all banded together and became friends and we would sleep in hallways and stairwells and we would steal food from the t the tobago the tobago what the fuck are those things Batago, no yeah it's, it's bodego bodego jesus christ it's been so long since i've been in new york the bodegos so you know like i'd walk by and just lift a watermelon like you know was, i'm admitting this now but you know i was a homeless teen that had no money and i was starving so um i ended up I uh, hang out on, on some steps one day. I met two lesbians, Bobby and Anita, who worked at an S&M club called Leather and Lace in Manhattan. Um, they took me in. They didn't do anything to me. They were super cool and awesome. Um, they got me a job at Leather and Lace. They were One was a dominatrix and one was a submissive. And I got a job underage answering telephones and making appointments for some of New York's finest to come in, politicians, doctors, actors, wow. all kinds of people to come in to this su super exclusive high end, uh, eight room fantasy S and M club. Wow. So, um, that was great. Uh, the owners were apparently like it was a laundering thing for the mafia, whatever. I don't know what the fuck was going on, but there was tons of cocaine and drugs, which I stayed away from because one of the things my mother did was a drug dealer. Mm. So, and her thing was Coke. And I, you know, I dabbled and tried it when I was younger. And then all I would do was like, you know, cry about my childhood. And I was like one of those downer Coke people like, <laughs> oh, right. So yeah. I realized and also, you see, I'm very hyper. So Coke does the opposite. It makes me crawl up in a ball in a corner. Yeah. So I realized, yeah, that's not for me. So I'm now at this S&M club. 
they, they have piles of coke on the fucking table. People are just snorting rails. And <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. And then um, I was just so uh, like fascinated with the with what the fuck went on there was a baby room there was a torture room okay can you baby room can you explain a little bit uh, there was a people size crib a people size changing table like a diaper table um so that men could come in and, and wear diapers and yeah be babies. and be humiliated and then um suck mommy's you know feet toes shoes uh be spanked be punished be put in the corner all that stuff. Mm. And I remember, you know, being inquisitive and also, you know, had fucked up sexual things happen to me as a child. So I'm like trying to just work out my shit as a teenager. And so I remember they let me sit in on a session in the baby room and I dressed in black because if you wore black, you were dominatrix. If you wore white, you were submissive. And I don't want anybody to beat me because my mother did that enough. So I remember standing in the corner with a cat of nine tails and I was really... I was really scared. And uh, I think it was Mistress Bobby. I think she was the the dom. So she's like, bad baby, bad boy, blah, 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 blah. And I'd be like, bad boy. Mm. And then I'd run back to my thing. And I was like, oh my God. And she'd be like, Mistress Samantha, you come over here and you tell him. And I'm like, tell him, oh my God, you're a bad, bad baby boy. And then I'd run back and I'm like, oh my God, this is really weird. So I just ended up having this bizarre idea of what men's role in sex was and like you know like it was a very weird way to learn about sex in an that's, SM club yeah that's a very niche yes yes and then they had these wednesday night socials where every wednesday night the doors opened it was exclusive like 500 dollars a couple back in the 80s and all the eight rooms were open and they would and there was like a big dance area with a you know horse and a torture wheel on stage and they'd put on shows and you know nail things through ball sacks and i don't know like just the craziest shit so i worked it we all had to work it all the employees so i realized that's when i realized don't walk around in white because everybody wants to hit you so you walk around in black and then you know i don't even know what the fuck i did i just looked cute and then they got word that they were going to be raided. And since I was at the front door, uh, I then went to go work for um, a... And so how old are you at the time that you're working at this club? 15, 14, okay. something like that. Okay. Um, then I had met a couple there. His name was Carter Stevens, and he was a very big pornographer at the time. And his wife was name was Baby Doe, and she was a performer at the time. And... Leather and Lace got me to become his personal assistant. And so I ended up moving in with him, her, and their son, who was also underage, Brayden. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lived there for a little while. And I did assisting and mailed package, like their VHS tapes out, you know, because he was a distributor and mm -hmm. he, you know, did his own movies and stuff. From there, uh, somehow I got into, uh, into Studio 54, underage, met one of the owners, uh, was asked to go pick up a bag of drugs, did that. And then all of a sudden, like I was let in there all the time dancing, like, oh, dude, it's so crazy. Then I met the owners of an Italian modeling agency who um, uh, wanted to make me a model. And I never thought I was attractive. I was an ugly duckling. You know, my mother always said that she didn't want me. Like I had such a negative self image of myself that yeah. these people wanted to make me a model. I'm like, really? I was underage. So my mother signed me away to the Italians. So, okay. So you were back in contact with your mother yes. at this point? Yes. Well, because I was doing well, you know, I mm. had a job, I had somewhere to stay and, oh, I even remember that. Fuck. Um, so with Carter Stevens and his wife, there was a fucking sex club called, oh my God, famous in New York. Help, help, help. It's the most famous sex club in New York. Help. I do not uh, know. Uh, I should Google it. But if anybody knows, definitely tell us at some point. Ernie, can you Google it? Oh yeah. Okay. Most famous sex club in New York. Like in the 80s. Back, back in the 80s. So I ended up going there with them and my mother. Yes, dude. Mm. So I was off in a room, I think probably smoking a joint and drinking. And there was like a, 
like a what's that thing called? A petri dish of semen. Uh, a uh, <laughs> petri dish of semen. Yeah, it was like oh, a jacuzzi thing. Like, but. It's oh. <laughs> It was massive. And just people doing who knows what in it. So I literally I thought it was like a bowl of cum. I was like, no. okay. No, it Sorry, was well. a fucking, it was like a pool of cum. It was just crazy. Did you so, find it? Yes. Oh my God. Plato's retreat. Yes. Yes. I actually went you, to Plato's Ernie, retreat. You win a prize. <laughs> with my mother. That is creepy as fuck. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so at some point she signed me away to the Italians they sent me to a farm in Maryland. How old are you now? I don't know, 15. Okay, yeah. still? Yeah. Okay. Like 14, 15. This okay. was like in those, okay. a lot happened to me in those fucking two years. Yeah. Um, went to Maryland. They had a model farm where they would find un undiscovered new models. Um, and then they would send you to this farm in Maryland, which was like going home since I was born in Maryland. And they would have... I think they had like four photographers, four makeup artists, and four models. And so everybody would switch every day. You would do this makeup artist, this photographer, and they would build your portfolio with the aim that they then send you to Milan to their agency, which is a very famous agency, the biggest agency in Milan at the time for modeling. Um, and then they send you there and you sign a contract. And basically they, oh my God, what was it? I think that they were supposed to get like, 40% of everything I made for the rest of my life. It was like some kind, yeah, it was some kind of crazy ass thing. And my mother signed me away because I was underage and I had to leave the country and go to mm -hmm. Milan. So um, it was basically, for me, it was a scam. Uh, other women, I don't know if they were really sent to model, but I was sent to be sex trafficked. And I was, uh, I got to Milan. Um, I was, put in like whenever you're a model and you travel to Europe, your agency usually covers your apartment and you pay it back through your work. And, mm -hmm. you know, they set you up and cause you're in a foreign country, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. And then they, you know, bill you back through your jobs. Mm -hmm. So they had a pension ready for me. I had like one or two other models in it, whatever. Um, when I got there, there were two playboys sitting at my dining room table. Hello, we're here to welcome you. Yeah, no, they had keys to the fucking apartment, dude. And it was basically, you know, and one of the girls was fucking one and, you know, I, I don't know. So you were expected to have sex with these guys? No, nobody tried to have sex with me, with those guys. We were taken to parties and stuff like that. And uh, specifically, um, I don't really remember much. It's so fucking long ago, but I do remember waking up tied to a bed with the editor of a massive magazine's cock in my mouth. And he, and, and, and I fucking flipped out. He let me go. I don't, I think he drove me back to my pensione. I flipped out, was like. Were you, had you been drinking? Did he roofie? Okay. All yeah, right. of course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not like I passed out and woke up in his bed. I, he was gonna, he was driving me home from some party that everybody was at and we had to stop by his house first. Right. And gotcha. then he was like, Hey, do you want to drink? And then all of a sudden I just woke up and I yeah, was yeah. like tied up. So he let me go. He took me back. I literally like frantically went into this modeling agency office screaming. I was raped, blah, 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 blah. By the time I got in there, that guy was in the office with the owner. They were chatting. And then Jeez. later that night, I was literally taken from my bed, put on a plane back to New York City. Wow. Mm hmm Then I was stuck. You know, I don't I was put into a hotel that other models lived in, including models that were with their agency. And it's called the Tudor Hotel. And the guy that owned it was in cahoots with those other Milan guys. So I lived there for a couple of months. Um, nothing weird happened. Uh, I just were you still it. doing like modeling gigs? And no, stuff? I had no modeling gigs. Like I never did a modeling gig, dude. But I had this portfolio. Mm -hmm. So one day, and Wilhelmina Models was literally down the street from this hotel. And one day, I just walked myself into Wilhelmina Models for an open call mm -hmm. with my portfolio, and literally they scooped me up. They fucking sent me right back to Europe. Um, and then this agency, the Italian agency, got word 
that I was in Paris. Oh, and I was slaying it. I had covers. I had magazines. I was on billboards. I was doing this. And they reared their heads and they contacted Wilhelmina and they're like, yeah, you know, she's under a contract, a lifelong contract with us. And you guys actually owe us 40% of her back money. And she, and they're like, really? Well, you, um, sex trafficked her underage to Milan and had her raped and then sent her back. So l let's go for it. Like you want to oh, come so after They us? protected you. Oh yeah. They're like, you want to come after her? We'll go after you. And they disappeared. I never heard from those motherfuckers again. Wow. And part of my modeling thing was I would never step foot in Milan ever. Wow. Never, never went back. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And Wilhelmina, God bless. Oh, it makes me cry. They were, I mean, I was literally, I was so crazy. I was doing cartwheels through the offices. Like I was the wild child. I, and I killed modeling. I did. I was the Jordash girl, 1984, 1985, um, during the LA Summer Olympics here. Um, Jordash was a sponsor. I literally had billboards outside of every event for the LA Summer Olympic That's Games. Amazing. Really cool. Like, so I've done amazing. I was like the Sebastian hair care girl. I've done so many great campaigns and covers. And, and then all of a sudden around like 18, 19, I had a midlife crisis and I got completely burned out and I decided I wanted to stop modeling and I wanted to go, I want, I want to be behind the scenes, but my behind the scenes was I went to work. So now I'm living in LA. Oh, so all around the world, I got my first movie in London with, uh, Monty Python. Um, and it was a serious movie. Um, it's a, a very little known movie. It was about drug addicts. So uh, that was my very first movie ever. When you say Monty Python, like uh, all like the guys are No, Monty Terry Python? Gilliam. Uh, fuck. Uh, John Cleese? Uh, no. Um, it was Terry and it was uh, the other main guy. Oh, my God. I can't think right now. I should have looked at my bio. And then Julian Doyle was the director, but he was the editor of all the Python stuff. Mm -hmm. So they came together and did this uh, – international film uh, about heroin addicts. And so there was a, a heroin addict from every country and I was the American. Mm -hmm. So it was a big thing to get me my work papers because Americans can't work in England. It was in England, like all this stuff. So basically uh, crazy shit happened for me to even be able to do that film. And then all of a sudden I thought I'm gonna be a massive star. I've just starred in this crazy movie and I was pretty good. I'd never acted before. Mm -hmm. I moved to LA. Um, and then I was like acting. That was like my thing. And then I started in a movie called Phantasm 2, which is a cult classic uh, for the horror community and a bunch of other movies. I had a small role in Weekend at Bernie's. That was basically, it was bigger, but it was cut out. Do you remember The Big Chill with Kevin Costner? I do remember, but I don't know if I was, uh, I, for some reason, remember Weekend at Bernie's really well. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, it was Weekend at Bernie's, too. It wasn't the first. Okay. It was the second one. So in The Big Chill, Kevin Costner was one of the stars. And somehow, some way, he, he was the dead guy in the, in the coffin. But he was in the whole movie as flashbacks. But when the movie actually came out, he just ended up being the dead guy in the coffin. And there was no flashbacks of him. So it's called being Kevin Costnered in that movie uh, right so okay. like when you're in a movie and then they cut you all out and you're like in one fucking scene so i'm in a conga line with bernie and jonathan silverman and it's like a famous scene and they show it all the fucking time but i was in saint thomas for two months doing that movie huh so so did the acting and blah blah blah, blah. um but at one point like i just with the modeling sort of i stopped it and then i became a receptionist at my modeling agency in la because I just didn't want to, I was sick of people touching me. I didn't want to worry about what I look like. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of pressure. It is. And then one too many ugly photos of me out there. I was like, it's a conspiracy. I don't want to do this anymore. Like I was like, <laughs> so um, then, I, you know, just here's my thing. So I have no education. Uh, I graduated ninth grade, went to two months of 10th grade. I have no like training of any type, but I've done a million fucking things that require training, broadcasting, everything, hosting television. I tell the kids in my house this all the time. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you haven't done. If you have a passion to do something and you really want to do it, you will fucking do it. You will find yourself a mentor in that industry. You will work under them. You will work for free to get to learn the thing that you would have to pay an education for. Mm-hmm. 
So um, I did all these free things. I was an intern on a radio program called The Big Show, uh, simulcast on Fox Sports West 2 and Extra Sports Radio for almost two years for free. Three morning, oh, sorry, sir. Uh, three mornings uh, a week from 6 to 9 a.m. I had to be there at 3.30 in the fucking morning. My little, you know, model friends thought I was an idiot. Like, why are you doing that? Like, they're explaining you and they're like, they're, they're making so much money off of you. I'm like, they're making no money off of me, dude. And I am getting a free fucking broadcast education. So I took all of my tapes and I took all my emails and I took all my fan shit and I went to 97.1. Bob Moore and Jack Silver, the program director and the general manager, and I pitched doing a show with Sheena Metal, who was on the station at the time. And we were off to the races. We had, you know, uh, in the middle of the night, it was like from from like 1 to 3 a.m. on a Sunday. Like it's the safest spot in the world if you fuck up and you do anything wrong. Nobody hears you. Nobody knows about it. <laughs> no, there's no FCC listening. No one's going to complain about you. <laughs> And it's a good testing ground for new shows to be put right. on in the middle of the night on a Sunday. Right, right. right. You know, gotcha. Nothing's happening. So uh, that started, as you can tell, I can talk. I never have, I'm never at a loss of things to say. <laughs> I have so much that I want to say. So I just had this gift of gab and a natural ability. I love to listen. I'm very curious about people, mm -hmm. like sincerely. So I think that's good. Like you, it's a good quality for an interviewer like you, you sincerely want to know this information yeah. not just like reading off a question right um so you know in 25 years i've been doing radio i've produced and host uh 25 different shows including yeah. the single life which is something i'm famous for yeah i hosted it with gary garver i hosted it with timothy leary i hosted it with arsenio hall who else i've hosted it with yanira johnson over at vivid radio when we were there for several years so that's like my baby, although I haven't hosted that particular show in forever. It's still my baby. Yeah. Um, recently, uh, I hosted a dental implant show. So I was back on the fucking radio. Now, I hadn't been on the radio radio in a while, and it was on KNX. Um, it's what's called a blocked show or a brokered program. So it's a doctor or a lawyer or a money guy, somebody paying to be on the air on the weekend. Mm-hmm. So they pay to be on the air. They pay the the station will provide you with a co-host. Mm -hmm. So that person will be like, hey, you're listening to implants for, you know, for life with Dr. Sean Ibrahimian and me, Sam Phillips. Give us a call, blah, 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 blah. Check out our website, blah, 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 blah. And then lead him through the questions to get all of his information out in an hour. So is um, it like a one time off show? Um, so his because I come along. It was, it was on for 13 weeks. You can not, talk about dental implants for 13 weeks? Okay, so here's the thing. He was supposed to record a new show every week to air that Sunday. Yeah. And he's such a busy fucking guy that he recorded one show that aired for 13 weeks, the same show, <laughs> in the same slot, over and over. And I would have at least, because there was four segments, I would have maybe swapped them around. But no, it just kept it consistent. <laughs> Got his message out there. But I have to just give a shout out to this guy if anybody needs. And I got to tell you. Okay. So we were supposed to do the show. Me and you. Yeah. After we worked together with yeah, Corey. Yeah. Um, I had just right then had the beginning part of an implant surgery. So right. I had no tooth in my mouth. And I'm not going to go like, hey, with my big ass mouth and have no tooth. I'm vain. I'm so sorry. That would have been great, actually. The six year old really, lady. I, I know you really would have loved that. it, dude. I'm like, no <laughs> fucking way. I have an image to uphold people. I'm just saying. So then, then, you know, there was the actual surgery. Then they put the fucking tooth on and it's a three month process. So hello. Hello. I've three got, months later. Your teeth are gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. E. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is crazy. Okay. So you've been through a lot. How did you end up nude modeling? How did that come about? Because as a mainstream model, um, I did uh, a magazine in France called L. Mm. And we have L here. Mm -hmm. Or we had L here. I don't even know if L's. E L L E. Yeah. 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 Um, so I did it all the time in France, but I was like topless and putting creams on my, I had no implants at the time, mm -hmm. cream on my little nipples, or I was running with like bags strewn across my shoulder, topless with like weird underwear on. So I was already fucking naked. Yeah. In Europe, like in British Vogue, there's like, to you're topless yeah. all the time. It's like yeah. totally normal. And then also I was raised by a hippie drug dealing mother. Um, 
and nudity was just everyone was nude in my house. They walked around nude. Everyone was like, everybody was. Yeah, nude. And when was you're like little, not, it's like you know, crotch an, height. Of yeah, like, not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> yeah, no. Mm. The images I just remembered are not great. But um, so I was just super comfortable, and I had originally gone to Playboy in an open call Mm -hmm. and they fucking Marilyn Grabowski was like you and took me but at the time I was anorexic I was too skinny Mm -hmm. and I started shooting with I want to say it was Stephen Weta um and I did one day of shooting and I got a call saying it's not happening Mm -hmm. and literally so These were my first set of implants. I've had 14 surgeries. My body does not like implants and they've encapsulated and I've just had horrible problems. Uh, Surgeons that have butchered me, just like the whole gamut. So this was my first set of implants and Pam Anderson was my best friend at the time, blah, 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 blah. Um, I went to her surgeon and because, okay, so, you know, nipples are all different, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not symmetrically sometimes on the same plane of your fucking chest. So one of mine was maybe a little bit higher than the other one. He put in two different sized implants, like substantially different sized implants in each tit. So when I became super skinny, it was just two round baseballs, but one was smaller and one was bigger. Mm. And in fact, your mom, who shot my centerfold for penthouse we had to do all kinds of things like draping you, yeah like there was the like bra, the, the, half demi, bras. The, de, the demi bra to yep. hold up the one side that was like lower than the yeah. other side so if anybody you know googles and looks up the old penthouse images of me you're gonna see like you see half my tit in a lot of stuff mm-hmm. so um uh where was i even going uh okay. playboy oh, they yeah. said no to so you they said no and um I gained weight. I went through a whole thing. Like I stopped taking the laxatives and all the stupid shit I was taking when I was younger, which I didn't need to take because I'm fucking skinny as shit. Yeah, dude, I was crazy. Um, I'm like, nothing's changed, but the laxatives. No, Um, I'm just still crazy. (laughs) Nothing's changed, but the laxatives. (laughs) Can I title this? Can I make that the title of this podcast episode? Yeah. Sam Phillips. Nothing's changed, but the laxatives. God bless. We're not actually going to title it. Though. No, do it. But it might... I give you full permission. Okay. Have at right. it. People will be like, what the fuck are they talking about? Lily be like, thank God I don't have to fucking think of something for this. <laughs> so anyway, then um, I, I, you know, uh, was I had a commercial agent. So I was still going out for commercials and doing commercials at the time. And I had a friend named Shauna Ryan, who was a penthouse pet. Yeah, I remember her. Uh-huh. She, the fucking most beautiful girl in the world mainstream model long black hair blue blue eyes tall gorgeous perfect amazing personality so she was i think september 1992 and i was june of 1993. Mm -hmm. so she did hers obviously before mine and i believe she had told me about sue's because and and the different photographers with penthouse because i'm like fuck playboy doesn't want me i'm just going to try penthouse Mm -hmm. so um looking at all the photographers no disrespect to the earls and the carls and you know the sam maxwell's of the world totally disrespect them it's fine (laughs) we're okay with that (laughs) but your mom has and you have the same the same rich uh lush like deep quality of color to your photos it's just rich i can't explain it more than it's just rich and 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 contrasting and vibrant and it just sucks you in you know, the, the look of penthouse at the time was like very soft focus yeah. and cheese clothy. And your mom was the one person that was not doing that at all. And as a mainstream model, I wanted to look like that. I didn't yeah. want to look like that. Yeah. Cause Carl Walker and Earl Miller's shots could look similar. Yes. They were both very, very like, like, cheese clothy, you know, Vaseline yeah. on the lens yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Which no disrespect, no disrespect. It was definitely a look and it was all initiated by Bob. That was yeah. kind of Bob's That was thing. his style. Yeah. 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 So um, I wanted your mom. And then uh, I went in, I met her, and then she pitched me to Bob and Kathy and uh, Jane. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, I was dating Richie Sambora from, uh, yeah, Bon Jovi. I, oh, by the way, when I say I fucked 500 guys by now, it's way more than that. But I definitely (laughs) cut a swath through a gang of like celebrities, actors, musicians, you know, smart people. 
you know, whatever. So I was dating Richie at the time and we dated for, I don't know, maybe eight months. I starred in two of his music videos. That's how we met. Uh. Of course. Stranger in this town was the first one. And one light burning was the second one. <laughs> I loved him. I did. So anyway, so when I went to go meet Bob and Kathy, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm a fucking hustler and I'm a business person. And I knew at the time penthouse was putting bands and celebrities on the cover with pets. So my, my, my issue, there's two versions. There's just me on the cover. And then there's Jay Leno and Julie strain on the cover. Mm. And they printed two versions. Mm -hmm. One, like I was told East coast, West coast, one U S edition. And one, I think Bob was like playing with like, which one would outsell? Is it a celebrity or can I just put a fucking pet on there? And mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, Oh shit, where, where was I going again? So you were, you pitched, you were pitched to Penthouse. Okay, that's right, okay. So I flew to New York, met with Bob, and I actually didn't fly to meet them. I actually flew with Richie, mm -hmm. and then decided, hey, I should meet them because I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I pitched them doing a cover with Bon Jovi, and then asked for more money, and then got it. And then um, Bon Jovi, they didn't end up doing the cover. There was like some kind of issue, but Bon Jovi, uh, John did do a celebrity interview. Mm -hmm. So I basically brought Bon Jovi to the table and felt that was worth something. And the fact that I was a mainstream model and yeah. you know famous and you know whatever. So I was like, yeah, wow, yeah. And so, then uh, yeah. my mom shot you. Yes, she and did. she was terrible to you. <laughs> She, I think I think your mom, like me, like she's an alpha. She's used to being in control. Yep. She knows her fucking shit. Yep. And the girls that I think that she shot at the time were girls that were like from mid America and they were kind of brand new and, you know, they were like not established. And mm -hmm. I was very established and I knew what I wanted to do. And when I met with Bob and Kathy, I told them my ideas for photos and they're like, great. And I said, well, I'd actually like to art direct my, my, my shoot, like. So, yeah, no, that didn't go over well. It did not go over well. I'm sorry. And then, of course, um, my one stipulation, and it was funny because I was sitting with them and their Ridgebacks, you know, Rhodesian Ridgebacks, there was like five of them, like just all like salivating. And I was like, hey, listen, like if you, you know, nudity comfort level. So, as you know, working for Penthouse, I, you know, when we intake potential models, it's like, oh, what's, yes, I know, you know all what's, about what's that. Your potential nudity, you know, <laughs> yep. you know, yeah. uh, you when know, I did it for level. when I did it for yeah. Pe Playboy, too. Like, yes, yeah. I can't tell you how many conversations I had with girls about like how much vagina, top of the vagina, yes, to like, the bottom, yes, three quarters, like, yes, no yes, butthole, like yes. very specific so conversations. Me, okay, first of all, when I was younger, still now. My ass is a little bit bigger, but when I was younger, I have that kind of ass where the cheeks didn't meet and you just see my asshole from the back. <laughs> I had no idea. So, you know, sometimes when models for penthouse are like, I don't want to show my asshole. I'm thinking, oh my God, but her ass does it doesn't even mean like, like the, all we can see is your asshole. Yeah. Like, like it's on, all man, asshole. Kid. Like no, hell, but all asshole. How are we going to cover that? So I told Bob, I was like, listen, I... I don't mind being naked, blah, blah, blah. If you want to see my vagina like this, if you want to see my vagina like this, if you want to see my vagina like this, I have no, no problem. I do not want to see my vagina like this. I do not want to rip it open. I don't want to have like flayed open labia. I don't want you to see my pee hole. I don't want you to see my urethra. It's just too gynecological for me. Um, so your mother... The reason why she hated me is I had a little pocket mirror that I fucking hid in everything and I would open and I'd be like, hang on, hang on, please. <laughs> and I would hold the pocket mirror and I'd make sure everything was together. I'd be like, I'm good. You know, there was a model once that my mom shot who I swear, Amber and I have talked about this. You can ask her about it. I swear to God, I think she glued her vagina lips together. <laughs> Like, because, like, she probably just didn't trust my mom to not fucking tell her or, like, to try to get more. Like, but, she, no, like. But your mom literally him. said to me, Ruda, get Ruda. I, we can't see any. I'm like, yes, you can. You can see everything. So, like, I, you know, it, it was hard for me. Like, yeah. that whole thing, that whole experience. And it's funny because my makeup artist was Emma Nixon, who be ended up becoming a pet. Mm -hmm. And. I remember 
like I taught her like weird shit. She still to this day will say like, you taught me how like uh, eyebrow liner can be a lip liner. And like just mm-hmm. this, I would do all this weird shit that I would learn in the makeup world yeah. and modeling all over the place. So I remember she, two things she did. She came to me in the dressing room in the very beginning and she did my makeup, blah, blah, blah. She's like, you know, do you want to clean off and do your thing? You know, like with your vagina. Girl to do stuff. Yeah, girl yeah. stuff. And then I remember she came in with a razor and I go, oh, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm good. I'm groomed. And she's like, no, this, cause she's also like British, Emma. Yeah, she's yeah, British. Yeah. She's like, no, this is for your asshole. And I'm like, oh, honey, no, 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 no. I do not need any razor in my asshole. There is no asshole hair in my asshole. And she's like, oh, but I'm sure there is There's always one. And you'll be very upset if the one makes it through. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, you do have a point. Okay. So I bent over and I gave her my asshole and she spread my cheeks. She's like, oh, well, I'm sure glad that I have this razor. I'm like, oh my God, Jesus Christ. So there was that. So I was like, and I remember telling my best friend at the time, like, oh my God, they shaved my asshole on the set today. What the fuck is happening? What in the haberdashery is going on here? Welcome to a Suze Randall set. And then the second thing, here we go. Is I remember that you know with my mirror and my my vagina closed and the whole thing and I'm there and I remember Emma just walked up to me with a lone Q-tip that looked wet and I was like, what 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 do you what? and she was like coming towards my my puss and I'm like what what were you doing with that and she's like oh we need to grease her up and I'm like we are not greasing her up she does not to be greased. She does not need to be all slick and wet and oily and weird. No, thank you. So it's like, you know, now we're always like, hey, sweetie, can you, you know, make it a little wet? You know, like on penthouse shoots now. So yeah. like, I understand it looks better when yeah, it's it wet. Does, it does. But like, I was just opposed to the entire thing. Like yeah. nobody's coming at me with a razor, a fucking oily Q-tip. Yeah. I, I mean, want, it's just- I want my mirror. Yeah. <laughs> this lady needs to stop yelling at me. And then she would complain about me. She was sitting on a dolly and she would dolly, dolly up and down, up and down her studio on a dolly, like a little. Oh, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. I used to so, use the same thing. Yeah. So she would be on her dolly and she had some guy assistant, I think. And she would like be close to me and she'd complain about me to him <laughs> in front of me. I'd like, oh my God. I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, Come on, lady. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> so, wow. but again, uh, her iconic photos ended up on 19 covers worldwide. Uh, yeah. To my knowledge, I don't know anybody else who has 19 covers. Yeah. You know, so obviously we made magic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forever, you know, on the pages of Penthouse. Oh, man. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. (laughs) It's okay. I love your mom. Like, I congratulate when you guys just did something recently. Like, she won a big award, I think. Oh, yeah. She won the Pioneer Award at Expos. Like, I was like, yay, Suze. You know, God bless. You're legendary. You deserve every fucking accolade. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's just just Suze. You know what I mean? And it's like, I mean, we were talking earlier, you know, it's like she most... It's just one of those people. She's like, you're hot or cold on her, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like you either have an amazing experience with her and you love her. Yeah. Or you don't. Yeah. And you can't but see, stand I her. had an okay experience, but I love her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, yeah, if you yeah. can kind of understand. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. And I'm sure I was not easy. Yeah. No, I get it. It's so funny now, you know, you think about like how the way shooting is now and you, you know, obviously being on, on the all these other sets side of working, yes. working. I mean, like, you would never come at a girl with a lubed up Q-tip now uh, in a million fucking years. Or a razor. Or a razor. <laughs> like, I just, I yeah. mean, you, you would, would have a discussion about of course. it. Of course. And you, you wouldn't just come up. No. Yeah. Or if or if you wanted to, like, if there's been a situation where I need to clean or get in an area because she's just not seeing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always like a, hey, yeah. do you mind? Yes. Can I do this? Yes, like, of course. Even, like, if I'm putting a bra on a girl and I need to lift her boob up to get some, like I will yes. never touch yes, a girl without asking her. Yeah, it's all about consent. So yeah. And yeah. it's just like, you know, I mean, the industry's changed so much. I mean, and you've seen all of this change. I mean, I've been in the industry for 25 years, so I've seen a lot, but you've seen more than me. Like what's the biggest change that you see these days? Well, I think honestly that with the advent of only fans and all the different platforms, sex Panther and fansly and, you know, sheer and just all these 
different ways that models are in control of their own content and mm -hmm. don't have to rely on being hired by an outside company. I think that's one of the biggest differences. Um, a lot of porn stars that I know, like going back for the five years that I had my model house in the one location, some of them aren't even in porn anymore and they're just you know existing on their only fans like mm -hmm. and occasionally doing a mainstream film to keep their name out there mm -hmm. so and and they get to keep all the money that or as much if you have a management company whatever you're parsing for yourself but you're in control of all of your content you mm -hmm. create it you edit it so i think that is completely different and also it's very one-on-one -on -one where you know with covid and all that kind of shit like um it allowed the performers to have one-on-one -on -one experiences with fans because you couldn't leave your house. Everybody was doing shit online. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that whole explosion of platforms is amazing. And we yeah. didn't have that before. I was going to ask you if you think it's like, a, I mean, now obviously as a model, I can see how you would see it's a, it's a great boon to the girls and, and as somebody who cares about the girls. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's definitely been producers and directors who've complained about it because they've said that it's taken away some of the best girls from studio work or right. people are then also what they, they, what they care they do. anymore about, like, coming to set. So how what's your opinion on that, well, being I mean, on that side? It, it, it kind of depends. Like, I personally, like, when production managing for Penthouse – have never been fucked over by a talent because they had some OnlyFans shoot. I do know that, you know, just because of people staying in my house, somebody might go do a collab, somebody ends up dirty. That affects the other jobs, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so, you know, um, a guy will, uh, you know, collab the night before a big scene and then not really be yeah ready to go like you know don't so, bust and, your nut kind of when you have a big right. a big so for those up. who don't understand that sometimes i have to explain the vernacular because oh, we yeah, get yeah. to like that porn talk yeah yeah um so when we say collab that means content creators not specifically porn stars but people who may only do only fans mm -hmm. are doing a scene with somebody else specifically for OnlyFans. That's like what we call a collab as opposed to doing a scene. Usually doing a scene is for like a big studio company or something like that. I mean, yeah. it can be like doing a scene for OnlyFans, but when we say collab, we yeah. generally mean that specifically. So so I know that people that. have complained about uh, the talent collabing prior to a mm -hmm. shoot. Because they're not under the same strict like rules and regulations in terms of testing and stuff because there's no production company. They're supposed company. to be testing and of they course, do. But they, there's no like, yeah. but it, so it depends, yeah. right? Right. Because there's no production oversight. There's no right. mind geek saying, right. you need to have a test and we right. need a record of it and we need to see that you're cleared and passed. Well, and that's why it's, it's up one to talent them. teaching, yes. assuming or trusting another talent. Right. Sometimes they don't know. Like, so it's like, yeah, but weird... I always tell them, see the test. Make oh. sure that you see the test. Always. If you don't see the test, don't fucking do the rest. Yep. Mm. Nice little rhyme there. I like that. Thanks. Yeah. They slip out every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay. So you've spent many years on the TV and radio mm -hmm. giving uh, advice about sex and relationships. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's something more vulnerable, I think, about showing your full personality on air than even being naked in print. Yes. Um, were you nervous about that transition? No. Uh, actually, when I started doing radio, I was nervous because it's live. You know, I just went straight into the fire. So I was always in fear that someone was going to catch me out on air and mm -hmm. say something about my past or ask me something that I was not prepared to talk about on the radio. Mm -hmm. So like I always had my finger on the dump button like for the longest time. But then nothing ever, nobody ever came after me for anything I, I, my whole fucking life. And I developed this persona in my first show with Sheena. God bless Sheena. We don't really speak or anything for a very long time. Um, and she was the more seasoned pro radio professional. I was just me. And she was always sort of like condescending-y to me and sort of talking down-y to me and belittling-y to me. So I started developing this persona on air without even realizing it of just being absolutely crazy and saying the craziest shit and realizing that I could say stuff and not get in trouble. And I'm really good at double entendres and stuff. So I realized that I could get away with saying scandalous, scandalous things without saying it 
but saying it. And then I would act stupid and I would like sass her and like I'd get back at her in all my, my, my little ways. And it was people would listen to hear the banter. Mm -hmm. So that sort of got my chops. And I was like, yeah, no one's going to, no one's going to fuck with me anyway, because I'm like, you know, I went in there all amped on like five pots of coffee and I'm like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give it to them. And, um, yeah, that was the only thing I was really afraid about. And then the other thing, because she was like the pilot of the show, meaning the seasoned professional. So in a radio show, you have the first seat or the first chair, the second chair, sometimes the third chair, sometimes the fourth, depending upon the show. So you have a pilot, a co-pilot, co-pilot, co-pilot. She was the pilot. So she did all the formatic. She introduced the show. She introduced us. She introduced the topic. She introduced the phone number, blah, 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 blah. So I was like the colorful commentary person. So I was always afraid of being that pilot person. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm just the colorful commentary. I can't do it. And then there was a program director named David G. Hall, who uh, I owe probably half my career to. Uh, Bob Moore and Jack Silver as one half and Dave Singer and the extra sports guys. And then David G. Hall, the other half, because he reached out to me. He was the program director of KBC and he reached out to me and he said, hey, listen, I've listened to you on the radio. I'm a big fan. And I think that you need to be a pilot. You're you're way bigger than a co-pilot. And I was like, I don't know. I don't think I could do that. And he literally put me on some AM station on a Sunday, like at 6 to 7 AM. Okay. By myself <clears throat> with nobody. And no, uh, I, don't, I don't even think anybody called. Like nobody called. I just had to talk for one fucking hour. So... I've learned the importance of show prep. Mm -hmm. I had I had hours worth of material. I was my big fear is running out of things to say and there being dead air. Yeah, that's the last thing that you want. And then I learned something very smart from Tom Likas, who used to be on ninety seven point one back in the day, a Howard Stern, you know, compatriot. I remember him. Um, if you ever listened to his show, he would say something and then say something again. So, and and like you would hang on his words. So I learned, oh, so if I forget something or whatever and I don't speak, it's not like people are going to know that. They're going to think I'm just doing a dramatic pause. So I learned that from him. Like, you don't have to chew up and fill up every minute uh, with sound. There's something about letting the air and the room breathe mm -hmm. around what you say mm -hmm. and not cutting people off and letting people finish their sentence and, you know, all that kind of shit. I had to learn all of that shit. And it really is something that you have to learn because it was the yes. same for me. Like I started this podcast. I didn't fucking know. I'd never interviewed people before. And, you know, one of the first complaints I got, and I've talked to other people who've had podcasts, they said the same thing in the beginning was like interrupting people because it's like you want to be able to continue the conversation. You might get excited because you want to, oh, wait, I need to interject something or tell you something before I forget it, right? Because yes. you're trying to like listen to the person um, and think add, about your right, next question, then, right, right? But also maybe ask them more about what they're saying. So you've got like a couple of things that are like. That's in why your brain. I would always have a pen and paper. Yeah, and I would just take notes because if I didn't get a chance to say it, then I would jot it down so then I could do a call back and come back to it if it made sense. Mm -hmm. One thing that Jack Silver taught me, my program director, don't chase a rabbit. So if we're talking about uh, your green dress, I'm not supposed to be like, "Wow, that lamp is beautiful." That's chasing, so, oh yeah, that lamp is beautiful. Where did you get that lamp? Now we're off the green dress. And if you were trying to sell this green dress, you'd have to redirect me off the lamp back to the dress. Mm -hmm. So it's called chasing a rabbit. Mm. So that's another thing I learned is, you know, you can take the conversation and go somewhere, but like wrap things in a neat little bow before mm -hmm. you kind of move on. Or if something comes up later on, do a call back to it. And it's smart because then people are like, oh, yeah, they were talking about that earlier. Right, yeah. right. <clears throat> so I if I like randomly brought up laxatives right now, that would feel like it made sense. No, yes, it would. <laughs> That's a callback. That is absolutely a callback. I, of course, like almost every girl in the world struggle, struggled with self-image and yeah. body image when I was younger. Yeah. I tried like the laxative route and like, did not work for me. I, I'm not, I, I, I don't I really like shitting, enough. but you know, like. Did I just not take enough? Like how are we gonna take? That's what I'm saying. Like, I think um, I literally, I'm right gonna say it's horrible. Like I've got a big mouth and a big throat and I can literally take a handful of them, take a thing of water and then swallow them. Like, mm -hmm. okay, when you say a handful, how many? Like I'm talking about like 20. 
What? Wait, at once? At one time. Okay, because I was No, saying, I ended up in the hospital. I ended up I in the emergency like room. That was my fault. With edema. That's when your body blows up with water. So I had a reverse reaction the Ooh. last time I ever took a laxative and never took a laxative again. Ooh. Mm-hmm. That is brutal. So when people talk to me about eating disorders, I really do understand. Like, yeah. I, I get it. I would never, ever do anything crazy like that ever again, and nor do I need to. It's like, I don't even know. Actually, I know. Somebody, a friend of mine was like, all you just have to have to do is like sit, take some laxatives. And I'm like, oh, really? What do those do? Oh, it keeps you skinny. I'm like, oh, okay. So then one, and it doesn't really work anymore, two. And then it's like any kind of a drug. Yeah. Your body has a resistance towards it, and you have to do more and more and more <laughs> to get the high or to get the poop effect or whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's rough on your body. Yeah, no, I know. Now all you got to do is take Ozempic. Yeah. Oh God. Which is probably I have a friend. I have a friend that just you. lost sixty five fucking pounds on it. That shit scares me, man. Because like I, you know, the, it can lead to serious complications, and we don't know what's going to do to people long term. And I know. Uh-uh. I know. No thanks. I know. I'm Anything that's an easy fix isn't so easy. Yeah, I just got, got lipo. That worked. <laughs> It was also like the worst experience of my life, but you know, uh, my friend that lost the weight on the Ozempic <laughs> yeah. also had lipo, and it was the worst experience of it was her terrible. life. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. but I'm glad I did it now. Yes, but at the time, it's horrible. The boy, recovery oh boy, with the, with the with the fucking the seal suit that you have to wear. Yeah, yeah. I did was doing this podcast with that. I had to bring like my butt pillow because I also got the BBL. It was oh, oh my god. Oh, oh I've oh, always oh, wondered about that BBL. Oh, so oh. you can't sit, can you? No, for six weeks you cannot sit on your butt. You can't even lay on your back. You can't even lay on your side. You have to sleep on your stomach, which I cannot do. I don't. I'm a back I didn't, sleeper. Yeah, I didn't sleep for like six weeks. It was fucking horrible. And then, d- like, does it move around? Like, you have to let it set or stay. Like, why can't you? Because you could, yeah, like. Just like move it, yeah, basically, because it, the it, the fat has to be has to like settle where the the doctor put it, so you can like squish it or move it or destroy. I don't know. But, does it does it get absorbed back into your body? Yeah. So after six weeks, like now, like my ass is good. Like you can't destroy it, right? Like there's nothing you can right. do to it to like make and it. Then the, the, and then the 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 fat that was transferred there didn't move anywhere else. It just stayed yeah. right there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's, and that's it's good. Like, it's think. good, and it's there for, yeah. I'm glad I did it now. Yeah. But it was awful. Yeah. Experience. Wow. So I was yeah. not prepared for how terrible that would be. Yeah. No, surgery sucks, dude. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have drains? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, apparently I smelled like warm pepperoni the whole time. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh my god, that's horrible! <laughs> I didn't know because I couldn't smell myself. But Who told you? My my assistant <laughs> Masha, and then also my husband. They were just like, oh no, like, stop it! Yeah, they were like so grossed out. I was so fucking high on painkillers. I didn't give a shit. Pepperoni <laughs> me! And I was like, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Um, okay, so last question. Oh, okay. Because actually, you know, I do have a Patreon question Ooh, for. Yeah for you after this one but the last question since we kind of touched on it earlier Mm. um you've slept with countless men Mm. and encourage people to do the same yes i do can you share your philosophy about why it's important to sleep around yes it's the same thing with the bachelor when when the batch when the girls get all pissed off that he had the the overnight date and he fucks all three girls Mm -hmm. of course he's gonna fuck all three girls you have to my whole try before you buy yeah well there's that but When you're a younger person and you're discovering your sexuality and you're discovering relationships and what works for you, um, I think that you should fuck as many people as possible before you settle down because you want to know what's out there. You don't ever want to have a second thought like, "Uh, I just married the first guy I ever fucked and, you know, eh, you know, like what else is out there? Like, no. The person that you choose to be with after fucking 500 guys, that is a special fucking person because you've had them all and he's better. Yeah. So, like, I just feel that you need to experience all. And I also describe it like this. Men are, uh, a, it's a, a, a buffet table with plates on it and, and with, with, you know, platters. Men are platters. They're platters on a buffet table. And a you have- Petri dish of semen. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Call back. So uh, it, you're like walking around this disgusting hometown buffet thing. Sorry, it's probably a great hometown. But you know, you're walking around with your little plate and you're like, mmm, furry man with no hair on his head. Mmm, tall jock guy with small penis. Mmm, 
you know, like a big fat man with long balls. Mmm. Little <laughs> short man with no dick. Mmm. You know what I mean? So you need to taste them all. Yum, yum, yum. And whatever you decide you like, you're like, oh, seconds. That's my entree. I'm doing him for dessert, but I'm going to, I'm eating him for my meal. So <laughs> You need to taste everything so you know what you want to load like up on. None of those things that you described were any of them were good. <laughs> Not one of them were good. I don't want any of that shit. Well, that's why you have to kiss a bunch of frogs to find a fucking prince. You know, they're all going to be like that. And then you find the really good one. You're like, yeah, I fucked them all. And now I've got you, pit, k- kid. Yeah, pig. No, that's not good. Kid, kid. There's a callback. Oh my God. Yeah. That is funny. So I think it's important to have a, uh, an array of sexual partners because Mm -hmm. how do you know what the fuck you want Mm -hmm. unless you've experienced it? Yeah, that's true. So that's true. There's no shame with sex. Yeah. I agree with you. You know, I definitely agree with you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you my last question from, um, one of my Patreon members. This is from Renaissance man merit. Oh, okay. Um, wasn't Sam on Playboy TV? Yes, I was. Uh, would love to hear how she got on the show and a favorite episode or experience. Oh, my God. That's a great question. Okay. So I was on a reporter on a show called Sex Cetera. Oh, I remember that show. I think we were on it at some point. Oh, I, I, you, yes. I, you were. You guys were. Okay. I don't remember who did the the segment. It wasn't me. Um, I was on it for like five years. Mm-hmm. And there were seven different reporters. Some of them ended up swapping out. Like Kira Reed was one, Susanna Breslin, Hoyt and Frank, uh, you know, throughout the years, Scott Potasnik. There was like people that came and went. Um, some like Kira Reed was always sent on the assignments where she would join in. Like if there was like some kind of like, you know, sex toy she would use it and you would see her use it like i wouldn't do that kind of like i was more like the interviewer but everyone uh, of the girls had to get naked at some point and then sort of get so if i i interviewed um an adult baby named baby timmy who's one of the most famous adult babies in the world so when i interviewed him you know wait dude this is a crazy story so when i interviewed him he had a ranch in New Mexico. Um, he lived in a, a people sized crib. That's where he slept. He had a people sized playpen in his living room. That was his furniture. He had a people sized high chair. That's where he ate. He had a people sized uh, uh, sandbox outside. That's where he played. But his parents were dead. He was adopted. He owns like 19 Arabian horses that were left to him by his parents. And he hires uh, ladies from like Vegas to play mommy and babysitter and come and take care of him. So we get there, the house smells like urine and baby powder, overpowering, overpoweringly. And uh, uh, so when we start, I start out in baby Timmy's room and I'm like, hey, and I'm in my clothes. I'm like, hi, Sam, Sam Phillips, first, et cetera. So then I get naked and then I put on like a little baby, a baby doll outfit. Mm -hmm. So then I proceed to interview him in a baby doll outfit. So um, he has the world's largest collection of monogrammed cloth diapers that say baby to me. Wow. He, um, so he does cloth and then he wears the rubber over He's environmentally <laughs> friendly. <laughs> and then he wears like the rubber outside diaper casing. So like at one point when I was interviewing, he's like, ooh, Timmy go pee pee. And like you see this yellow thing spread on the cloth diaper inside the... Okay. And can I tell you something? So I'm at 97.1. I'm doing a radio show with Gary Garver. We're being syndicated in San Francisco and San Diego and a couple other places. And at the time, this was our old, it was in a different building. And in Conway and Steckler's uh, studio, which was the nighttime guys from like 8 to 11 p.m. on 97.1, was Drew Carey. And he was filling in for them. Mm -hmm. So me and Gary were doing our show through the, the thing. And Drew Carey's like, waving at me hey and i'm like is that drew carey gary and he's like yeah what the fuck and i'm like hey so we both take a commercial at the same time he leaps out of the of the studio and he goes hey sam phillips etc and i'm like yes that is me oh my god he goes oh my god baby timmy that's quite the story and i'm like i'm like yes it was so he started telling me my different a couple of different segments that he saw that i watched and i was like wow and he goes big fan and i'm like 
That's so because at the time he was all over television. Yeah, he yeah. was fucking everywhere. Yeah, and I'm like, Drew Carey's a big fan. Cut to probably two years after that. Um, there were these two producers that were trying to get me to host a TV show. I wasn't. They're trying. They're not trying to get me. They're trying to get NBC to hire me to host it. It was for the PAX Network, which were the Christians at the time, mm -hmm. owned by NBC. We had a breakfast meeting. We were going to go in and do this big pitch with me to the executives. We're at like Bob's Big Boy or something. We ask for the receipt, the the bill, and the waiter comes over and he goes, "Um, that man down there has picked it up." And I'm like, "It's Drew Carey." I'm like, "Oh my God, it's fucking Drew Carey." He walks up the table. He's like, "Sam Phillips, etc." And I'm like, oh, "Drew Carey." I don't know so, why I thought you were gonna say Baby Timmy picked up the bill. No, no, <laughs> Drew great. Carey again. <laughs> so I introduce him to the two executives. He's like, "This girl is amazing," and they're like, "We know." And I ended up getting the show. Wow. Extreme Fakeovers. And I don't know, like Drew Carey, the biggest fan of Succedera, and I'll never forget it to the day I die. Amazing. Isn't that crazy? Amazing. Yeah. All thanks to Baby Timmy, man. I love Baby Timmy. <laughs> Well, Samantha, thank you so much. It's been, I know we could go on for hours I know, and hours I, I know, and hours because like you've got so many stories, so much. but you know, for now we're just going to have to hold on for, for maybe take two. Ooh, okay. Um, can you tell everyone where they can find you online? Yes. Um, I'm on Instagram, Sam's Pajama Party. I'm on Twitter, The Single Life. I have a YouTube channel that I haven't updated in like 20 years. Um, it's at The Sam Phillips. Okay. I keep I keep hitting your microphone. That's okay. Oh. Um, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch episodes like this streamed live, as well as get access to bonus content, merch, and all kinds of goodies, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Go to hollylinks.com for links to all of my social media profiles because I have a lot. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and I will see you next week. Bye.